but it ended up with a fearful game called Dynasty, which, as far as I can make out, was I say I never played it, went on forever because there's no way of ending it. It was almost a substitute for living, as far as I could make out. It took hours and hours and hours. I thought it was quite a terrible game. I, I couldn't imagine anyone getting getting taken up with that. But um, well, Stephen always had a very complicated mind, and I felt as much as anything. It was the complication of it that appealed to him. When I was in high school, I learned that light from distant galaxies was shifted to the red. This meant that they were moving away from us, and that the universe was expanding. But I didn't believe it. A static universe seemed much more natural. It could have existed, and could continue to exist, forever. We were discussing the possibility of the spontaneous generation of life. And I think that Stephen made a remark which indicated not only that he thought of this, but he'd even also come across some calculations as to how long it might take. At that time, I think I made a comment to one of my friends, John McLenahan. I think that Stephen will turn out to be unusually capable. I don't think I put it in quite those words. But I made some such remark to him, and he disagreed. And so we made a bet on the subject. In our childish way, we bet a bag of sweets on the issue. And incidentally, I reckon that my bet has come correct, and I think I'm entitled to payment which has not yet been made. The expansion of the universe suggested the possibility that the universe had a beginning at some time in the past. The point at which the universe may have started out became known as the Big Bang. The first year he was at St Albans School, he came, I think, third from the bottom. So I said, well, Stephen, do you really have to be as far down as that? And he said, well, a lot of other people didn't do much better. <laughs> he was quite unconcerned. Somehow, he was always recognised as being very bright. And in fact, they gave him the Divinity Prize one year. That was not surprising, because his father used to read him Bible stories from a very early age, and he knew them all very well. And he was quite well versed in religious things, although I don't think he makes a very great deal of practice of it now. Everybody used to argue theology. That's a good, safe subject. You don't need any facts sort of <laughs> distracting things like that. If you go in for arguing, you know, debating, you can quite happily debate about anything, including theology and the existence or otherwise of God. And then someone gets bored or journey into space comes on or something like that. The argument breaks up. In an unchanging universe, one can imagine that God created the universe at literally any time in the past. On the other hand, if the universe is expanding, there may be physical reasons why there had to be a beginning. An expanding universe does not preclude a creator, but it does place limits on when he might have carried out his job. When the family went to India, it was arranged that Stephen should come and live with us for a year. He decided it would be nice that we should have Scottish dancing in the evening. Now, mind you, this was a it was a quite an ordinary house, but we had rather a lot of room and a large hall, and so we bought um, some records and a book about what you do. And Stephen took charge. And he insisted that you put on a jacket and a tie. 
And then he was the master of the proceedings. And Stephen took it very seriously. But then he liked dancing, you see. There were four physicists in my year. Gordon Berry, Richard Bryan, Stephen, myself. I first remember Stephen on an occasion when Gordon and I went up after dinner to his room to try to um, find him. And Stephen was up there with a crate of beer, slowly drinking his way through it. He was only 17. He couldn't legally go into a pub. He'd gone up to Oxford ridiculously early. We used to have what we call a gathering net. We used to organise a, a beer party and, and various things like that to gather all these colours, as many freshmen as we could get, you see, to get them to join the boat club. And that's how we collected him, you see. But the question always to Stephen was, um, should we make him a cox of the first date or the second date, you see? Well, coxes can be adventurous, and some coxes can be very steady people, you see. So he was rather an adventurous type. Never knew quite what he was going to do when he went out with the crew. I think he used to bring his work down with him into the boat sometimes, you know, his sort of thinking gear was going on different levels. <laughs> we were asked to read a chapter, chapter 10, in um, a book called Electricity and Magnetism by Bleeny and Bleeny, an unlikely combination, a husband and wife team. And at the end of that chapter, there are 13 questions, all of them final honours questions. I discovered very rapidly that I couldn't do any of them. Richard and I worked together for the week, and we managed to do one and a half questions, which we felt very proud of. Gordon refused all assistance and managed to do one all by himself. Stephen, as always, hadn't even started. But the next morning, he went up to his rooms at nine o'clock. And we came back about twelve, maybe five.